Welcome to Gotta Run. This is Will Sanchez. This show is dedicated to Save the Putnam Trail with my special guests, Michael Arnstein and Victoria Arnstein. First, I want to thank the studio, the Firehouse Manhattan Neighborhood Network. As you notice, we're in a slightly different studio because the one on 59th Street is being rebuilt as we are taping today. I heard about Michael Arnstein when I interviewed Oles Perman over a year ago. Michael Arnstein, mm -hmm. he's quite well known in the uh, local circuit. He yeah. goes by the Fruitarian. He has a website. He, he's notable because he only eats raw fruits and raw vegetables. That's for about three years now. He has been one of the co-founders of the Holiday Marathons, and he and his wife Victoria are one of the defenders of Save the Putnam Trail that we're going to talk about. So please welcome Michael and Victoria. Thanks, Will. Hi, thank you. Guys, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where were you born? Something about your family, a little bit about your schooling. Uh, I'm one of three children. I'm the youngest. Uh, my family and I, we grew up in uh, New Jersey, this other faraway land uh, across the other side of the river. And uh, we live here now in New York, and uh, I got a great wife and three children, and um, I consider myself a a New Yorker, but I, I still love to visit New Jersey. <laughs> Great. As a youngster, Michael, were you actively involved athletically? As a teenager, young teenager, I was into video games uh, and junk food. But, but I did get into running when I got into high school and, and <laughs> have stuck with it ever since. High school. Was there something that happened in your schooling that said running was going to be a, uh, a lifestyle for you? Both my brother and sister, older than me, took on healthier habits, and, I, and my father was very active and exercised each day. And I, I guess, you know, when I wanted to develop into a, a more mature person, I decided it would be a good idea to take on some, uh, some exercise, and, and running was my first choice. Your first choice. Now, you mentioned junk food. Right now, you're famous as being a fruitarian, which is a diet that consists entirely of fresh vegetables and, and raw fruit. How did that happen? How did you make that transition from junk food to uh, what you call junk food to this new way of eating? Well, this special woman right here sitting next to me, uh, I got to say she does get most of the credit for introducing me to fruitarianism. Uh, she gave me a book uh, by somebody who's been a practicing uh, fruit eater for I think about 30 years and um, the book resonated with me. I just <coughs> felt that food as it's made in nature with nothing else done to it, with no processing, seemed really simple, really healthy and uh, it's how just about every other creature on the planet eats. Uh, so I thought I'd give it a shot and it, it was uh, transformational. 80 10 10 where fruit is the primary source of your calories a very low fat uh, everything being raw and uh, unprocessed interesting so what were you before a regular guy regular joe in terms of hamburgers and i think my wife and i we kind of bounced around on diets we we you know, we started to get older and keeping slim wasn't so easy we we had three kids together we were always vegetarian and i wasn't i was a meat eater so i was really on the other spectrum yeah, we, 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 uh, when we got married, I was a vegetarian, and Victoria moved towards that direction with me, um, which made me very happy. And then, and, and she was really the seeker of like the next level. Interesting. Well, Victoria, introduce yourself to the audience. Where were you born? Something about your family and, uh, and your schooling. Yes, I'm Victoria Arnstein. I used to live in Brooklyn and um, one of five children. And uh, what about my family? <laughs> Do you want to know? You want to watch five? You're how many? Awesome. You have brothers and sisters? I do. I have three brothers and a sister. Was there a favorite? That would be me. Uh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. And I was the most loved in the family. Okay. Yeah. This won't be a surprise to the other four. They might be surprised to hear it now. But it's finally, I'm just going to finally tell them. Cool. As a youngster, were you athletically involved? No. I was never athletically involved. In fact, my diet consisted of just like white bread and lamb chops and I and pizza. And I was totally out of it by the time I was in lunchtime, I was completely out of it, daydreaming in class, not focused at all, just very lethargic all the time. I was not athletic at all. I have no athletic background. So what happened that change? I married this guy. So, how did you guys <laughs> meet? Is there a story to that? Yes, um, I was working in a jewelry store on Madison Avenue and he was selling gemstones and we were talking and it turned into 45 minutes and um, 
I had his card and I called him the next day to ask him a question that I never answered and uh, we were friends at first and then they never bought any gems. Well, he liked me a lot more than I liked him, but then afterwards, I, I fell for him after that. And then he got lucky. He got lucky. <laughs> I, I can see that. At, at that time, you were both vegetarians? No, I was never a vegetarian until uh, about four years ago. Oh, four years ago. So Michael was a vegetarian at that time. and uh, He you, encouraged me. He encouraged you. He, he encouraged me, but I, it was too difficult for me because I was very addicted to meat, and I thought <laughs> it was my staple in you know my diet. and. I didn't see anything wrong with it. Now I know too much. I do it both ethically and um, because it's uh, very unhealthy. I, I, in my opinion, I don't think. So what, in your mind, make the transition easier besides being married to Michael? I studied it. I didn't do it because anybody told me to. I looked at the factory farming, and I was very turned off. And I, it was just a compilation of a lot of things. And it finally all came together for me. And I realized, you know what? There's no need for me to eat meat ever again. And I never touched it again. Was there a, a phase where it became a transitional phase where you had to go and first eat? Yeah, I took out dairy first, okay. and then I took out eggs, and then I took out meat, and it became, you know, a very gradual thing and really a journey. And every single day, um, I say what serves me and what doesn't serve me, and I, and I make that decision to not put those things in my body anymore. Okay. And okay. if I want to be a better athlete. Okay. And now you... You said you never ran before you met Michael, but now I think you've done recently like 100K or something like that? Uh, I did an ultra, you know, just for fun. Like I'd signed up 10 minutes before the race. I was dropping him off at an ultra marathon. It went around in a loop one mile. And I thought, you know what? I could always stop at any time. I ended up doing it, not complaining. I didn't, I covered about 50 miles in 12 hours. It was a 12 hour race. And you know, it was fun. It was just a day of, you know, being outside and meeting nice people. And then I said, oh, are all ultras like this? And <laughs> well, Vermont wasn't exactly like that, but um, I did a 24 hour race. We had to stop at the 18th, at my 18th hour because Michael, um, uh, we had to make a plane or something. Well, how long ago was that, that Victoria? That, that was uh, two years ago. Two years ago. And then this year, just for fun, I mean, he said, do you want to do Vermont 100K? And I was like, all right, so I'll do it. I didn't think I was going to win, but he gave me a training program to follow, and I never followed any training programs. And I said, I did a few marathons. I did those ultras. Let me try it. I'm not going to win, but I could be top five. <laughs> then I saw I was in top five and then top three, and then I said, oh, my God, I could really win this thing. And there I was. Woo! You did it! <laughs> Uh, in Vermont, they have two races running simultaneously. They have a 100 kilometer race and a 100 mile race. And the Arnsteins came in first and first. Well, I had I won Not the that year. I won the 100 mile race last year in 2011. In 2012, um, she ran the 100 kilometer race, and I ran the 100 mile race. But uh, I had I'd run the Badwater 135 mile three days before <laughs> the Vermont 100. Yeah, it was so a little I, close. So I, I finished uh, in I think thir 13th place. Oh, amazing! <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So back to back. To I'm Arnstein's. much more impre impressed with what he did than what I did. Well, I trained I, I, for it. It's very impressive. And, and you got three children. You said earlier before mm -hmm. we started. Are the children involved in the diet the same way? So now I joke about that. Now, did the children they follow a vegetarian diet? They were brought up on other things, but. I took out the meat, they've learned more about it, and they don't want it anymore. Um, but I joke about how I was an ultra widow when Michael was doing all these races, uh -huh. and now my kids are ultra orphans because <laughs> we're both doing it now, so well, now, hopefully they'll join in one day. I see. Well, <laughs> getting back to you, Michael, you, you mentioned you'd won Vermont last year, and I think you've won several local races. And now a Yonkers Marathon winner. Uh, this is the second oldest marathon in the United States and uh, there's a lot of history in this course. Next up for him, a grueling 153 mile race in Greece. Good luck with that. In Yonkers, Chris Jacobs. But if you've done very exotic races, this year you did something from Athens to Sparta. It's 490 BC, late September. Darius, king of the Persian Empire, disembarks 40,000 soldiers on the beach of Scania in Attica. Its aim, the capture and destruction of Athens. 
The Athenians are preparing for the upcoming conflict and are searching for allies. They decide to ask for help from the Spartans and they send a foot messenger, Pheidippides, to Sparta. Herodotus, who chronicled the events of the era, mentions that Pheidippides arrived in Sparta the next day. Herodotus describes the unprecedented feat like this. Can a man make it through an impassable 246 kilometer mountain path within two days? Very difficult race because it's, it's, uh, it's not just the distance. You go over uh, some quite uh, some large mountains. Uh, it's ex exceptionally hot. Um, and, uh, and, and you can't, you can't walk. You have to, you really have to run this race, uh, cause you have to arrive the next day. Um, so make it, they're cutoffs, right? cut and I didn't make a cutoff. So this year in 2012, we went back and Oz and I finished. We're to stick together. We got teamwork, you guys. Great teamwork. They are Spartans. We are Spartans <laughs> is by far uh, my greatest running achievement um, and probably will probably always be my greatest achievement. Oh, sounds amazing. And in fact, I was reading over 375 or 400 people started and only 75 Yeah, finished. it's about an 80% DNF rate. And that got one of the highest DNF rates, did not finish rates ever. Yeah, it How did you race. feel when you crossed the finish line? I've done most of the greatest running races in the world at this point in my career, and I would say that the Spartathlon by far, uh, not by far, but by, by a large margin, is, is, is probably one of the greatest finishes in the sport. It, you, you finish in Sparta, um, and you can imagine after running for over 30 hours, uh, emotionally just being able to finish is, is incredible. But you finish in, in, a, in a place where there's so much history, um, where there's so much pride in the people that, that, are, that, that are Spartans. But do you touch something, a flag, yeah, so, a statue, so, so, you so kiss you, a foot, yeah, what the, do you the, do? Yeah, you, you finish at the, at the feet of, of a, a, an enormous bronze statue of King Leonidas, the hero king of the Spartans. And the, the statue is incredibly intimidating and... Uh, Was it the actual size of the man? There, <laughs> it's, it's a very large statue. Right. There's dozens of uh, flags flying from all the different countries that are represented in the race. It's a tremendous international uh, event. It's, um, it, it's, it's an event that I think is, is kind of... It's unknown, but it, sh it, should, it should be well more known. Oh, my goodness. And you had your buddy O's there with you. Yeah, and we finished together at the same time. Oh, that is fabulous. Yeah, it's, it's quite an amazing experience. That's fabulous. Every breath I take, I'm breathing. Now, this year, you also did, or maybe it was last year, Leadville. It was another race that you finished first. I run uh, anywhere from 25 to 35 major events a year. My goodness. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've run the Leadville 100 mile many times. I ran it this year. I, I did the Badwater 135 mile run through Death Valley this year, uh, the Vermont 100. Um, I've run the Boston Marathon every year for the last 18 years. Uh, I've, I've, I've run a lot. <laughs> I've, 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 there's a, a bunch of under, other hundred mile races I'm sure I've left okay. out. At this point in, 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 in my life, running, I've matured to a level where um, it's, it's, it's not as difficult anymore. Um, and it's, it's, it's more difficult to find things that are very rewarding because I've done so much. And, and that's why I'm, I'm planning on retiring from running in large part or from competition. <laughs> uh, at the at the end of 2012, because I, I've I've reached about the, I've reached many finish lines, and at this point, I'd like to try to do something else. So okay, now is it my turn? Is, happy is, about that. is it my turn to run? <laughs> and I uh, get yes. and you watch the kids. I'm going to watch the children, and my wife's going to go do the sport. It's recorded here. <laughs> it's 
excellent. <laughs> Documented right here, excellent. huh? Now he, now he can't back down. What is the Putnam Trail and why are you passionate about it? I can vividly remember the first time I was ever on the Putnam Trail. I was really astonished at how incredibly natural and beautiful this, um, this just piece of paradise right in the middle of the Bronx was. And, uh, and I subsequently have, have been running on the Putnam Trail and walking on the Putnam Trail and bird watching on the Putnam <laughs> Trail and, and, and taking my kids on the Putnam Trail with, with their bicycles for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and I, I still find it to be the, the, the highest quality kind of nature retreat in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I've been visited just about every park in New York City, every major park, and I, I think the, uh, the Putnam Trail is uniquely uh, special and it's something that, that we should preserve. And you've been around the world. I mean, you spent all over the world running, and, and still the Putnam Trail is home for you. The it's a little jewel box. It's, it's, a, it's a piece of paradise. It's, it's just fantastic. And, um, and It's right near New York City. I mean, it's like you're in the woods. You're in this magical, you know, wooded area, and it's right out of New York City. It's like out of the concrete jungle, and you're just right. transformed into another place, and it's so close. Okay, but now what's going on? The Parks Department wants to do something to that Putnam Trail? I'm, I'm in favor of improvements on the trail, uh, but one of the things I'm not in favor of is, is taking away the, um, the, the unique natural environment of the trail, which, which is uh, first and foremost the trees. Uh, they want to widen the trail uh, from its about six to eight feet uh, width now to 16 feet. And, and that's, that's going to drastically change the, the, the canopy the of landscape. trees. The landscape is not going to look as nice. And also, I think you said they want to put asphalt over it? Yeah, they want to pave it with asphalt. I mean, they want to put a, a, a highway lane going right through the entire length of Van Cortlandt Park. And the Safe Department Trail wants to use something else? The Safe Department Trail is advocating stone dust, which is used in, in, in virtually all the other trails in Van Cortlandt Park. And it's something that's uh, compliant for people that need uh, you know, wheelchair access. It's, it's, it's certainly things that people on bicycles could ride on or baby carriages. It's a surface that's you know, inherently natural to the natural environment. And asphalt is something that falls apart. And there's a lot of asphalt trails that haven't been maintained properly in the park. I just feel that it's it's just it's a bad decision, uh, and we should go with stone dust. Stone dust. Now I think your campaign has garnered signature from all over the world because you know the Bronx is known to all over the world. The Van Cortlandt Park is famous. We were got over 1,300 signatures, and it's a. Uh, it's something that's been a, a joint effort by, by all users, by bikers, bird watchers, runners, walkers, hikers, people that are you know disabled. It's an issue of preserving this natural environment in an urban, you know, atmosphere where we don't have natural okay. settings. This is an important issue because once you pave this this trail, it's going to be paved forever for generations after generations. But not too long ago, I was on the trail with and a group of uh, young children in the second or third grade came in with a class. If you came to Van Cortlandt Park right, in a couple of years, would you want to come on this trail and see it as a as a as a wide road that's paved with with asphalt, or would you like to see it as an environment like it is right now, where there's leaves on the ground? Like this. They were being shown, you know, these are this is an, an, an oak leaf and this is an elm tree. And you know, this is, you know, there used to be old railroad ties here. And the kids were really interested. They were really into this natural environment because they don't see this. It's all concrete everywhere. Yeah, that's a field trip. That's and I, and I, asked, I asked all the kids, I said, hey, you know, hey guys, you know, they're thinking about paving this with asphalt. I said, hey, who, who wants that? And, and everybody said, no, no, don't touch it. And, and we need to preserve this for, for the next generation. And it's really, it's really an important issue, and I'm very passionate about it. Uh, I, I could hear it, and I think a lot of people hear, hear. How can people help? You know, they're watching, they maybe hearing about the Putnam Trail for the first time. Look at that camera and, and that, t tell people how they can help you. Well, I appreciate it. If, if, if you are a Bronx resident, uh, you can write letters to your local, uh, local rep representatives. You can go on the SaveThePutnamTrail.com website and sign the petition. And you can also include a passionate comment about why you don't want to see these changes taking place that the Parks Department is, is proposing. And you can also uh, make a donation on Save the Putnam Trail to try to uh, help our legal fund to, uh, to try to do what we can to persuade the Parks Department to change their, uh, their plans. Well, if you approach the local uh, politicians, the community board, have they been helpful at all? This project is funded by the Federal Highway Administration. As a consequence, it must be ADA accessible. That's a requirement. That's not an option. 
Clark's department has said to us repeatedly, every time this issue has come up, the only way the Clark's department can maintain ADA accessibility on the public trail is if it is paid. They understand that there are times when rock dust can be made ADA accessible. In order to do that, you have to have a maintenance budget and a maintenance staff that the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation does not have. The maintenance budget for the Department of Parks and Recreation has been cut every year since 2008. So the issue for the Parks Department, very simply, is maintaining the trail once it's constructed. That's why they're in favor of a paved trail. The politicians have been uh, very uh, good at being politicians, in my experience. They, uh, they like to walk the line very uh, carefully. Uh, it's been frustrating working with the politicians. I'd say that uh, we have some support um, in, in them listening to our concerns, but I can't say that I've been very impressed with them really looking at the, the, the number of signatures and, and, and petitioners that we have on our side and, and, and not moving, moving towards what the community wants, which is not to pave and widen this trail. That's amazing. And now, you're familiar with community boards. They're supposed to be the local voice of the people. Have they invited you to present an alternative to the, what the Parks Department has been doing? Community boards ha has also been another frustrating experience working with. We, we've written letters to them. We've tried to, you know, ha get them to be involved in this situation. Uh, but what was unfortunate is that the, the, the New York City Parks Department told the community board information that was not accurate. And they, they made uh, the ruling on what they recommended for this uh, improvement on the trail on information that wasn't correct. Uh, the Parks Department had said that paving was mandated in order for them to receive the funding from the from the federal right. government, which is absolutely untrue and not the case. And now trying to get the community board to revisit the issue has been very uh, difficult. Hmm. Now, because of Hurricane Sandy, I think we were talking, there's probably going to be a delay in rehabilitating the Putnam Trail, if you want to call it that, because of other issues. Is there an opportunity there for you guys to... Well, We've always said that there's bigger and more important priorities for the Parks Department to spend this money on, on, on infrastructure that, that needs repair, that needs to be up, you know, upkept at a level that it's not. And we really believe that after Hurricane Sandy, that the Parks Department should you know, take these funds and move them to places that, that are needed more than the Putnam Trail. Okay. And I, I think Mayor Mike, he has funds tied up into this because I think a chunk of money for the Putnam Trail came from him, right? Yeah, the million dollars of New York City taxpayers' uh, you know, funds are going to pave a beautiful nature trail in the Bronx, and that okay. seems like well, a waste. We, we can only hope this broadcast uh, will, will help the cause, then uh, we'll certainly do our best. And uh, because we're a little bit out of, running out of time, I wanted to touch upon you know, some of your future challenges, both uh, you know, athletically speaking. You know, what's, what's on your plate, Victoria? What's on my plate? Um, well, I just did a 50 mile uh, beautiful run. I finished under nine hours. I was very happy about that. And I came in what, 10th in the uh, country? We both ran together the 50 mile national championships. And, in Tussie? Uh, in, in Pennsylvania. And Tussie Vic Mountain Back. And Victoria placed very high up in the rankings. Excellent. Excellent. But what about 2013? Well, it's um, definitely an open book. I'm going to look into, now that he's going to be watching the children, I'm going to be looking into some races that I could dig my heels into. I'm, I'm excited. We just signed up for a... a we, he signed me up without telling me. Those are the ones I usually do well in, actually. We just, we're going to run around Mount St. Helens. It's a 50-mile race uh, next September. But the kids will probably eventually be joining you in these runs. They're still too young to, uh, to make the Right trip. now, I trained. I did train, um, and when they were in sleepaway camp, it was easier for me. But, you know, the summertime is very easy for me to train. Um, during schooling and homework time, well, one of us has to be around. So oh, okay. Oh, we're going to take turns. But eventually the kids will join you. Sounds like it, this is a long-term, mm -hmm. you know. Sounds like it's uh, going somewhere. Oh, but, you know, you mentioned family. I wanted to talk about your mom. Because I saw her, <laughs> she was crewing for you at some oh, yeah. event. Which one? Which one? Which one was that? Uh, yeah, my my uh, my mother it crews for me occasionally in, at the Leadville 100. Race. The Leadville 100, because yeah. you had the video, and she was honestly very good right next crew. to you. She was the best thing in the video. Really, that was good, right? Yeah. 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 See, so you like hummus. fruits and vegetables? But hummus would, would no, 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 no hummus. Okay, <laughs> lemon juice. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, no, I, 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 I love my mother. Love she, uh, she's been uh, quite supportive, and uh, she's always been um, 
somebody in my corner and I'll, I'm very grateful for that. I love hummus. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, thank you both for coming on. This thank has you. been a pleasure. And, uh, and I wish you all the great success in your future endeavors, whatever they are, in running and saving the Putnam Trail, and hopefully we'll get the great support. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks, Will. Thank you.